I wish I had been brave enough to help her out. Now you'll probably get to have sex. I never get to have sex except with myself. I've got balls of steel. Balls of steel, what is that? There's always a fascination towards cut content in games, a forbidden fruit, if you will. It's common for games to go through many iterations or restarts in development. Things that were shown to the public prior to launch receive heavy overhauls or never end up seeing the light of day. Somewhere at these developer studios, prototypes or early builds of these versions lay around. Despite how well received the end product can be in some cases, there is still some fascination to seeing what could have been otherwise. And some of these builds, some of these prototypes have made their way into the community at large, for fans to take them, pick them apart, and build something from them. One notable one was Resident Evil 1.5, an earlier version of Resident Evil 2 prior to development being restarted. It's something that the community has poked at for a number of years. That was going to be the focus for this video, but recently made this into a bit more than just looking at one game for this video. That being the Duke Nukem Forever 2000 one build. So let's take a look at two major titles with two very different histories, and so far different approaches to how fans are tackling them. As a leaked build came out a number of years ago for Resident Evil 1.5, and it's something that fans have fixed up over the last few years, let's take a look at that one first. Do note some of the footage I'll be using here comes from old sources, so there's going to be some potato quality here and there. Most of the information here comes from the Hunt for Resident Evil 1.5 by Richard Mandel. If you are interested, I'll have a link in the description to the book. This was released in late 2018. This video has more of a Cole's Note summary of it. He did a very deep dive into forums and fan sites. He talked to a number of various sources to get a pretty clear picture of what happened here. Richard was part of the Resident Evil 1.5 community since the late 2000s. Before going forward to make things easier, let's clarify the difference. Resident Evil 2 is the final retail version that was released in 1998, the one we all know and love. Resident Evil 1.5 is the RE2 that was shown prior to its cancellation in February of 1997. Initially, Resident Evil 2 was set for launch in May 1997. Shinji Mikami, the director of the first title, was the producer. Hideki Kamiya was making his directorial debut. The two clashed over the game, with Mikami not finding it up to par. One of the most notable aspects being the police station. At this point, it was structured like a modern station. He found it dull and boring, and rooms were looking too similar to one another. In February 1997, screenwriter Noboru Sugimura was brought in for review, and said that the title needed a major overhaul. The plot of Resident Evil 1.5 was aiming to wrap up the series instead of giving it room for continuation. Beyond being set in Raccoon City, there is next to zero connection with the first title. While most of the characters present in this version would stick around, they would receive heavy rewrites with a number of shifts in the plot. Hideki Kamiya wasn't happy at first, but said it was the right choice in the long run. Sugimura would help shape into what we now know as Resident Evil 2, and would stick around to work on other Resident Evil titles. On February 17, 1997, Resident Evil 2 was announced to be delayed until August 1997, which would then be pushed back to early 1998. The Resident Evil 1.5 version they had up until this point is known as the 80% build. It's called this due to comments from staff members on how complete it was before they overhauled the game. This build has never made it into the hands of the public at wide. However, there are rumors of private collectors who are in possession of it. Back in November 1996, Capcom Japan burns a CD of a build of Resident Evil 1.5 for Capcom USA to use for demonstration purposes. This build here is known as the 40% build, which fans would spend many years hunting for. However, after the delay, there was no real need for it, so it's likely these builds ended up in various desk drawers of employees. In the summer of 1997 with E3, Capcom USA is promoting Resident Evil 2. This promotional video ends up being a combination of the 40 and 80% build of Resident Evil 1.5, along with footage of what would become the retail release of Resident Evil 2. In September 1997, Capcom releases Biohazard 2 Trial Edition, a working demo of Resident Evil 2, and almost all the game backgrounds for the last half of Resident Evil 1.5 are contained on the disc for the Japanese edition. This would be discovered by the community years later. For the release of the director's cut of Resident Evil 1, four clips were included from Resident Evil 1.5 of what is the 80% build.
1999, two reporters from EGM while visiting Capcom Japan to check out Resident Evil 3 requested to see Resident Evil 1.5, which they were granted. However, no copies were given, no pictures were allowed, and no notes were taken. An online community would emerge in the late 1990s of trying to get their hands on a build of Resident Evil 1.5. One of the most notable members was Alzair, who for a number of years would serve as the leader in regards to finding a build of Resident Evil 1.5. A number of fan sites would pop up. Ah, the good old days before everything was segregated down a couple of handful of websites. One of these sites was Bioflames. One major find for the community was a Capcom employee sending them a number of screenshots of the 80% build. The community would collect any information they could from magazines and footage released from trade events. At some point in the late 90s, the 40% build would make its way into some of the hardcore collectors of rare games. The hunt for a build for Resident Evil 1.5 in the late 90s to mid 2000s would lead to a number of dead ends. Someone would make a claim saying they had the build only for it to not be that build or they were just trolling. There would be a few cases on forums where someone claimed that they had a build only to get hounded by the forums and disappear. Whether they had a legit copy or not was hard to say. Some in the community were reconstructing maps from all the images and various data that had been collected over the years. One noble find was getting access and extracting the old Resident Evil 1.5 data that was on the Japanese Biohazard 2 Trial Edition. This had nearly all the background images of the factory and lab sections, although it would be up to the fans to piece together the layout, puzzles, and everything else. While interest in the community was waning, the winds of fortune would change. In the fall of 2007, the state auction was held in America of someone who was a former Capcom developer. Including this estate sale was a copy of the 40% build of Resident Evil 1.5. The community, led by Alzair, got in contact with the one who came into possession of it, who was known as the Curator. Negotiations occurred, and the Curator demanded $10,000 for it. Alzair and his team backed away. Other offers were made, but none were taken. The curator started to toy with the community, including putting up the build on eBay for 125,000 USD starting. He'd also put out footage from the game on YouTube that had not been seen before. The next few years would see fans take all the info they had on Resident Evil 1.5 and mod the PC Resident Evil 2 version to make it. One Martin Biohazard would release a PC mod in September 2009 that would take all the information to create a number of rooms. In 2011, the curator returned. He was a collector of a number of rare games and systems, dev kits, and financially wise, it was starting to catch up to him. He was selling off a good portion of his collection. Alzair and his closer circle began talks again, and a copy was bought from the curator in the $8,000 to $9,000 range. The amount was pulled together by a number of individuals. And in November 2011, a decision would be made that had long-term ramifications for the community around Resident Evil 1. .5. Alzair and a small group gathered to play it, and they could see why the game was cancelled. What they got after all this time wasn't that promising. 41 rooms were on the disc, 17 accessible, and lots of major bugs. The idea that they were hoping to be on the disc wasn't there. So they could release it to the community at large and let others take a look at it and go from there. But that isn't what happened. Instead, Team IGAS, I've Got a Shotgun, was formed. This was a small development team, and their goal was to get something more playable to share with the rest of the fans. They did not release the 40% build to the community as is. Although some copies made their way around those who helped buy the game were shared with friends. However, the build was not shared with the community at large. This knowledge would eventually get out, and there was a growing frustration in the community that the team should just release the build untouched as is. Team I Got a Shotgun said they would release the raw build untouched, which came to be known as the Pure Vanilla build, or PVB for short, when they had a build that they were happy to share with the community. The reason was to show them just how much work was needed for the build to mean anything. On an interesting note, a private collector around this time contacted the team, claiming to have other builds of Resident Evil 1.5 that were further along. Perhaps the 80% build just prior to cancellation, or a build in between. Not only that, but they had a prototype cartridge of Resident Evil Zero when it was set for the N64 release. <laughs> However, this never came to fruition, and it's hard to say if this was legit. One noble individual of Team I Got Shotgun would be Gemini. If you've ever used Resident Evil Classic Rebirths on PC to get running on modern systems, that's his work. During 2012, another major find for the game at large was someone obtaining parts of an early planning scenario of Resident Evil 1.5 to help flesh out the story. Alzheimer would step away from the community around this time to focus more on his personal life. 
On February 17, 2013, 16 years to the day that Resident Evil 1.5 was cancelled, Team I Got Shotgun released their first fixed build of Resident Evil 1.5, known as MZD. MZD standing for Magic Zombie Door, a reference to one of the bugs in the game. However, they did not release the vanilla build as promised, which created further frustration in the community. This is where the author of the book, Richard Mandel, steps in. In May of 2013, an eBay auction went up for a PS2 test kit that included a few unreleased games, including a 40% build of Resident Evil 1.5, which went mostly unnoticed by the community, but not by Richard. He would win that auction. He sat on the build for a bit, as there had been some drama spreading throughout the community. There was a growing divide between those in support of Team I Got Shotgun and the pure vanilla community. The vanilla side were frustrated with the changes that Team I Got Shotgun were adding into the game, saying some of these changes amount to be more of a ROM hack compared to following the vision of Capcom. In September 2013, Richard sent an ISO copy of the build he won from the auction to a few select individuals who were in the purist camp. One of them would leak it to the public at large. While Team I Got Shotgun would still poke and prod at their build, people like Martin Biohazard and a small team would poke away at the MZD version for a number of years, and they're still worked on till this day. To note, as far as I know, Capcom did nothing in regards to shutting down Resident Evil 1.5 fan projects. In fact, they've always been pretty good with fan projects. The only exception I'm aware of is the Resident Evil 2 fan remake, because Capcom were doing their own. Inside sources at Capcom have given assistance to the Resident Evil 1.5 community, but many sources would go radio silent after. Now, to note about the book that there is a bit of a bias, the author, Richard Mandel, was a pure vanilla build supporter and has a pretty big beef with Team I Got Shotgun, especially Gemini. According to Richard, members of Team I Got Shotgun tried to get the book publisher to not print and release the book which in turn led to more sales of the book. And it's something that Richard could have taken in the court over if he wanted to, but decided not to. So make of that what you will. It is a pretty fascinating story to follow, with a community that was mostly united, only for it to divide and egos to clash once a copy of the build was acquired. I'm wondering how different things would have been if the team released the vanilla build at large when they acquired it in late 2011, instead of holding onto it for a select few to fix up. It also harkens back to a bygone era of the internet where forums were king, multiple fan sites, a time before everything was filtered down to a couple of handful of websites as it is today. While most of the fan sites are now gone, they're always searchable via the Wayback Machine. So, the game itself. With that said, how is playing Resident Evil 1.5 these days? As of writing, the last major update was January of 2022. All you need is a PlayStation emulator and you're good to go. I'll provide a link to the latest build that you can play. The amount of technical wizardry that's been put into this is incredible considering what they have to work with. There are still a number of bugs, like enemies disappearing through walls or not descending downstairs properly. Granted, this may also be by the emulator I'm using. <laughs> You have access to the debug menu, so you can hop around rooms or access items in the inventory. That said, it is fascinating to play through this and see a what-if version of Resident Evil 2 had this been put together by fans over the years. Of course, one of the major differences being the police station. It's very sterile, for better lack of a term. A lot of the rooms look similar to one another, it's not as interconnected. It's easy to see why Shinji Mikami wasn't a fan of it. Still, there's this interesting atmosphere with it as a result. Then again, that could very much be a fact that in some other timeline, this was the end result we got. The sewers, factory, and lab section are much more similar to what was released in the final version, especially the lab. While Leon is still here, it's Elsa who is a change in between versions. Elsa Walker bears a lot of similarity to Claire on the personality front. She was changed to Claire to have a connection with the first title, with Claire being Chris's sister. It was nice for Capcom to throw a bone and have the Elsa outfit in the remake of Resident Evil 2. Sherry was still present in her scenario. John ends up being a bit of a combination of what would be Kendo and Ben. For Leon, while he's still a rookie, this isn't him being late for his first day. Marvin plays a much larger role, and Ada's more of a researcher than the femme fatale spy. Instead of Chief Irons being a corrupt psycho, here he's a helping force. One of the interesting enemies that pop up in Resident Evil 1.5 are these swinging gorillas. I first checked out Resident Evil 1.5 around three years ago, so it's come quite a long way in regards to the latest build. Which leads to the question, how much further work needs to be done before it's considered quote-unquote done? Besides, it's not like Capcom themselves completed this version. Over the years, plenty of data has been collected to piece things together, but there's still aspects that will be up for fans to fill in the blanks. It's very much worth checking out if you haven't, even if Capcom did make the right choice in doing a rebuild with what would we end up getting. To many, and myself included, Resident Evil 2 is one of the best, if not the best in the series, and one of the best games of all time. Had they gone through and completed Resident Evil 1.5, I don't see that being the case. Still, there's another fascination with it in a forbidden fruit kind of way. 
I'm cocked, locked, and ready to rock, Duke. So that initially was all I was going to cover for this video, but then the Duke Nukem Forever 2001 build leaked May 9th, 2022. The history of Duke Nukem Forever has been well documented, but for a brief summary. After the success of Duke Nukem 3D in 1996, 3D Realms would start work on their follow-up, Duke Nukem Forever. Instead of using their own engine, the build engine, they would make use of the Quake 2 engine initially. In 1998, they'd switch over to the Unreal Engine. Director George Broussard would always keep pushing for more. It was common for him to see something in another game and want that included. The studio would remain mostly quiet until E3 2001, and let's become one of the most well-known trailers, the Duke Nukem Forever 2001 trailer. They're everywhere! People are turning into monsters! There's no place to hide! Please help us! Man, this thing is really pissed off! We're all gonna die! Duke, the situation has deteriorated. It appears they have the president. The Earth Defense Force has been compromised, and I'm afraid you can't trust anyone. Hey, pal, what are you gonna do? Save the world all by yourself? What was shown in this trailer dazzled fans, including a young boulder punch. However, scope creep kept making its way in, which led to further engine switches, resulting in development being started over and over. It should also be noted that the team size was kept small, something that many on the development team know led to the game getting constant delays. Due to the success of Duke Nukem 3D and the build engine being licensed, 3D Realms were able to foot the bill for development for years, which would be a double-edged sword. What the fuck is taking so long with Duke Nukem Forever? There's of course been the hookers and, and the cocaine. There we go. Yeah, See, I knew it! <laughs> most, most of all, there's been a lot of World of Warcraft. 2009, development was suspended with 3D Realms and Take-Two, which owned the publishing rights, could not come to an agreement on requesting more funds. X3D Realms staff would continue working on the game, and they collaborate with Gearbox Software to finish it. In 2010, Gearbox would acquire the IP of Duke Nukem, and in 2011, Duke Nukem Forever would release to mostly, eh, reviews. And to know that I've never played it, I've seen enough to know just how well lackluster it looks and how it was. Would you like me to trash your mics? You don't fucking get it! The scene's done! Now, the rest of the crew left for Duke Burger, and my moment with Johnny is over! Thanks to the aliens, I'll never get that moment back! While it went through many iterations that were shown to the public throughout the years, it's the 2001 E3 version that stuck with fans as the version they would have loved to see. For a time, former developers would note that this trailer was heavily staged. However, that turned out not exactly to be the case. When ownership changed with 3D Realms with Slipgate, they acquired the company archives of various builds. The version that was furthest along of that 2001 E3 build comes from December 2002, which was estimated to be around 80% complete. Hey look, an 80% build. It'd be shortly after in early 2003 that work would be restarted when a Doom 3-like renderer couldn't be added to the current build and engine. Slipgate Ironworks had known they'd be more than happy to release the builds to the community. Of course, the issue is that they don't have the IP rights to Duke Nukem. That would be Gearbox. And who runs Gearbox? Well, that's one Randall Pitchford. And we all know how Randy Bobandi could be. I like to think of him as the DSP of the gaming development world. And when asked about over the years, he said things like there's barely anything to the build, licensing issues, classic Randy. In 2018, leaked screenshots and videos of the 2001 build would pop up on 4chan, but nothing came of it. More leaks would appear on 4chan in 2019 and 2020. And on Sunday, May 8th, 2022, Mother's Day, more video leaks would happen. A user going by XORJump would post a video link to the build. In the rare case of OP actually delivering, many requests were made in the thread, which video proof would be provided of for the validity of the build. They said to wait for June for the build to be released, as they need to fix up some performance issues. So word was starting to get out, and many were concerned that while waiting until June was ill-advised, as that gave time for the project to be shut down from a legal standpoint. However, in another rare case of OP delivering, it was all a ruse. For the next day on May 9th, XR Jump returned. Like anything related to the game itself, they released this 2001 build earlier than promised. And with that, the 2001 build of Duke Nukem Forever made its way into the wild. The two builds included were from August and October 2001. Where did this leak come from? Well, from the unlikeliest of places. What up, Fred, George, and Randy? It's Bam Margera here in Florida with a broken-ass elbow and wrist thanks to some little shit-ass who waxed a half-pipe coping like a fucking Eskimo iceberg, and I broke my ass. Anyway, I just wanted to let you guys know that it was me. I leaked Duke Nukem Forever, 2001. You left the USB, and I found that shit and leaked it. Yeah, man. But in all actuality, it could have been a former developer, someone at Gearbox, at Iron Gates, 
private collector, who knows. Not only were these builds included, but the source code was as well, along with a level editor. So those that want to put the game together have a huge step up compared to, say, Resident Evil 1.5, which required a shit ton of reverse engineering. And with that, fans have started to form some teams to put something together, the largest one being the Duke Nukem Forever 2001 Restoration Project. But of course, what would fan projects be without drama? After all, Resident Evil 1.5 had quite a bit of drama in that 2011-2013 range when the team had the build that they were not releasing. However, the drama so far with Duke Nukem Forever has been different. Instead of forums and IRC, development talk has shifted to places like Discord. And like a moth to a flame, Discord for whatever reason loves to attract the centrics. I did lurk the Discord earlier on when it was public, and the number of furry profile pictures were concerning to say the least. After all, we don't want another case of Fallout the Frontier on our hands, do we? We want Duke, not someone inserting their fetishes in the game. A lot of humans find us attractive. I don't know how to feel about that. Well, I know how the Queen feels, at least. Since then, the Discord servers for the development team have gone private. I have seen some people reaching out to the community at large, saying things like, don't worry, we've had hours-long discussions about how we're not going to have modern politics or ideologies included in this mod. Which, okay, that's great that you're doing that, but the fact that you need to have hours-long discussions over this instead of, like, 30 seconds for Duke Nukem? Well, I guess that's the modern cultural landscape for you. There's also been some drama between John St. John, the original voice actor of Duke, and Gianni Matragrano, who will be doing the voice of Duke for the Restoration Project. Your SOS will beep and notify you of an incoming call from us. Make sure to answer it. Alright, when I pick up, you better tell me what you're wearing. Ah, uh, Twitter drama, the pettiest of drama. Johnny, if I have advice for you, please spend less time on Twitter. And be careful, you seem to be appearing in fucking everything on the indie front. Be careful you don't become like Troy Baker who appears in everything. Of course, it should be known that this isn't the only group working on Duke Nukem Forever. There are other smaller teams working on it as well. Though, since it's been 20 plus years, who knows how long things will take. If we wait this long as is, what's a few more years? There's also a possibility that these fan projects can receive the cease and desist treatment. However, from what I understand due to acquisitions, this power lies outside Randy Pitchford's control. Gearbox, which bought the IP for Duke in 2010, is now under the Embracer group, so they would have final say. An image that's popped up in my mind that I'd love to see happen is Randy seething that he can't take in a fan project turns out to be much better than what Gearbox released. That said, someone at Embracer can still take it down if they wanted to. So, the game itself as is. And when I downloaded it, I really couldn't believe it. When I was greeted to the Megadeth version of the Duke Nukem theme, I couldn't help but grin. Now, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. That said, a few hours I spent jumping around the various levels, and there's really something awesome here. You could really feel the Half-Life influence all over it. There's something charming yet really eerie with some of these text-to-speech placeholders. Great, now I can use the tools in the garage to get the car in again. Now you can get to the club and see what's going on out here. Oh, thanks, sweet thing. Here, take this pass up to the private dance area. I've got something extra special I want to do for you. After that show you just put on. Some levels are much more fleshed out than others. There are aspects of this version that made its way into the final release, so those could be used as reference to an extent. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of creative liberties that need to be done, and filling in the blanks to piece everything together. For example, having a flashback to the first level from Duke Nukem 3D. Of course, there are development notes scattered around here and there throughout the years. Unless more leaks happen, like the 80% build from late 2002 making its way out there, a lot of the filling in the blanks will be at the discretion of those working on it. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Expect drama, but hopefully the project is able to come together, whether it's a combination of teams, the big restoration team, or a smaller one. As they say, always bet on Duke. It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum. And I'm all out of gum. Okay, get off the uh, get off vent, or I'll have you bent. Eat shit and die. I've got balls of steel. That's uh interesting. <laughs> you have just been banned from the vent server. And Blow it out your ass. <laughs> Who did that? Hold on I don't one know, minute. That was that's not me. Somebody's playing a joke on someone again. <laughs> what the heck was that?